Put down the remote, set your phasers to sun, and pick up that paperback. You do have books in the 24th century. Welcome to episode two of Reading Trek, a Star Trek book club podcast. A proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. My name is Marty Ali, and I'm joined by my co-host, William Conlon. Will, how are you doing today? I am doing great. How are you, Marty? I am fantastic. Happy to be here as always. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are Star Trek Book Club Podcast, working through the expanded universe one novel at a time. Although we do encourage you to follow along with the reading, this podcast was designed as a way to give all fans a way to journey through the expanded universe together, even if you haven't read the books. If you're reading along with us, revisiting an old favorite, or if you just want to know more about the expanded universe, this is a podcast for all Trek fans. We've broken the show up into three main segments. First, it's Turn the Page, where we're summarizing the reading and giving our first reactions. Next is Highlight the Text, where we dig a little deeper and talk about the characters, plot writing, and how it all connects to canon. And last section depends on whether we've broken the book up. We'll either have Peek Ahead, where we'll give our theories on the rest of the story, or we'll have Shelve It, where we wrap up the novel and give our final thoughts and ratings. Before we get into today's novel... I realized we recorded episode one last week and forgot to do something very important to a Star Trek podcast. We never talked about our personal history with Star Trek. Will, how did you get involved with uh, the Star Trek franchise? Well, for me, it's kind of just always been there. I was born right before The Next Generation premiered on television, so the first seven years of my life, I had that weekly amazing experience of seeing first-run TNG. I remember being a really little kid and watching Best of Both Worlds and spending the whole summer talking to my brother, you know, what happened? What happened when he said fire? All those things. And um, then uh, a little bit later in life, I uh, I went to Las Vegas and I uh, went to Star Trek The Experience, and that was awesome to actually be on the bridge of the Enterprise D, so that kind of set me as a fan for life. I watched Voyager, DS9, Enterprise, all those great ones when they were on TV, and uh, here I am today. I'm uh, two years into going to STLV events. That's actually how you and I met, and uh, I'm a diehard. How about you? How'd you get into Star Trek? Uh, Well, unfortunately, I got into it after the Star Trek experience closed. Um, My fandom started actually with the 2009 J.J. Abrams film. Um, And I love the film so much that I went back and tried to watch the original series. I watched a few episodes of season one and said, nope, and then went to TNG and fell in love with TNG, DS9, Voyager, and then eventually went back to the original series after having a larger appreciation for the franchise and watched that show. Um, But yeah, since 2009, I've been a fan, went to SCOV for my first time last year. And now uh, here I am hosting a Star Trek podcast. Yeah, isn't that great? And and I think it's so cool that uh, people who, you know, maybe didn't like the original series to begin with, they may have grown up seeing reruns of it, and then they watch the later ones, and that'll give them an appreciation to go back. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how it worked for me. Yeah, so no matter where you are in terms of your fandom, just keep watching Star Trek. Eventually, something's going to win you over. There's like 700 hours of it, and as we are establishing with this podcast, there are almost as many stories to be found in book form. That is true. Many, many more stories to be found in book form. All right, well, with that said, let's get to today's selection. That's the book. I know it's a book. The book. Okay, so today we will be discussing Grounded by David Bischoff. Uh, Well, I'm curious, where in the Trek timeline exactly does Grounded take place? The question isn't where we are. It's when we are. I'm glad you asked, Marty. Grounded takes place around Stardate 45229.6 during the year 2368. That would place it during the fifth season of The Next Generation. Uh, Anything we should know before we dive in? I actually have a couple bits of trivia today. Um, Grounded was first published in March of 1993, and it was adapted from a rejected Star Trek The Next Generation episode proposal and is the only Trek novel to be written by David Bishop. It's not his only Trek writing credit, however. He co-authored the Next Generation episodes Tin Man and First Contact, the um, episode, not to be confused with the movie First Contact. In addition to some 75 original novels, Bischoff has written tie-in novels for well-known movies and TV sequels, such as Alien, Alien vs. Predator, Farscape, Gremlins 2, The New Batch, Space Precinct, 
SeaQuest DSV, and Johnny Quest. He has also written show business related nonfiction under a variety of pen names. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Will, for the recap. But first, we'd like to remind you that from here on out, there will be spoilers for TNG's Grounded. Black alert. Black alert. Will, would you be so kind and turn the page for us? Last time on Star Trek The Next Generation. The crew of the USS Enterprise-D is responding to a distress call they received from a science station on the planet Fadra. The director of science operations at this outpost is Dr. Adrian Tilstrom, whom Captain Jean-Luc Picard has a romantic history with. Dr. Tilstrom's son, Miguel, is also stationed there. Upon arrival at the planet, an away team finds the research outpost in ruins with Dr. and Mikhail Tilstrom, the lone survivors. Mysteriously, the entire station is covered in a shimmering silicon-based mud, which the away team and shuttlecraft get covered in while investigating. Upon return to the Enterprise, the mud is examined, then supposedly jettisoned into space, only to have pieces of it attached to the hull. Unbeknownst to the crew, the mud is actually sentient and begins to expand and fuse with the Enterprise's hull. Meanwhile, an autistic, partially telepathic teenager named Penelope Winthrop befriends Mikhail Tilstrom, and after some encouragement from her friend, Data, she asks him to the jazz dance being held in Ten Forward. While the pair dance, Geordi is leading a disastrous EVA excursion to investigate the material attaching itself to the hull. A crew member is killed, and the grave danger to the Enterprise is revealed. The Enterprise, under reduced power, limps to the nearest starbase and is ordered to be destroyed by Starfleet Command to avoid this being spreading to other vessels and stations. Given the being's ability to attack inorganic matter, Commander Data is forced to stay on board the Enterprise while the crew attempts to find a way to subdue the malevolent creature. As the Enterprise is tracked away from the starbase to be destroyed, Picard, Riker, Geordi, and Worf secretly beam aboard and assist Data with discovering a method of stopping the ship's destruction. After discovering the inorganic being is controlling Mikhail Tilstrom and realizing he is being used to sabotage Picard's plans, Penelope uses her telepathic abilities on Mikhail to help distract the creature and give Picard and the crew enough time to defeat it. After some teching the tech, the mud is defeated, leaving the Enterprise severely damaged, but finally out of danger. Repairs begin while Captain Picard rekindles his relationship with Dr. Tilstrom, and the crew comes together to enjoy a series of volleyball games on the holodeck. The end. Nicely done, Will. Oh, first reactions. My first reaction after reading this was similar, similar to that of Samuel Jackson in Snakes on a Plane, if you know what I'm talking about, with the mud on the starship. Um, I could just see Captain Picard shouting, get this freaking mud off my freaking starship now. And hey, we're in a position where we might have a Quentin Tarantino Star Trek, so that line is not out of the realm. It is not out of the realm at all. I mean, it's it's kind of funny the the main villain of the story is 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 mud not not hairy mud but literally wet dirt <laughs> i had that exact same reaction <laughs> you know it's a it's interesting because we've had uh characters like armis and you know i'm i'm sure mud has played other uh places in star trek but wow you know clay dirt the villain <laughs> yeah <laughs> i also thought like Picard's at Caltech in the middle of this book in a flashback. And um, he's given tickets for free meals, which uh, kind of confused me on whether or not that they actually have money in the future. Yeah, there's a reference to money in there, which I thought was a really interesting yeah. choice. We, we've heard of like Federation credits and, of course, there's gold-pressed latinum, but I've never heard a direct reference to money on Earth before. Yeah, neither have I. We now know the name of Riker's jazz band. The Federation Horns. Or is it anyone in the Federation that plays a horn? The Federation Horns? Maybe. Do they have like a big Facebook group or like a meetup? Do they get notifications on their pads every time something happens? Like how does that work? Yeah, I love that there was even that reference in there of him hitting the, the one bad note. Any requests? Nightbird. Ladies and gentlemen, Nightbird.
was that all about? Will's been trying to get this piece right for 10 years. He's never made it through the solo. <laughs> yeah, that was good. I like that reference a lot. Yeah, for for me, uh, my my first reaction was that this was kind of a, a fun TNG episode. Um, I could see immediately why it was rejected as an episode because the special effects budget for this would have been off the chart. It, yeah, that would have been incredible to to see them do that whole rolling whole spacewalk scene, which we'll probably talk about later. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, there there wasn't a single EVA sequence a la Star Trek First Contact, the movie, in the whole of TNG. Am I right on that? Yeah, not that I can recall. I know they went out on Enterprise, and they had EVAs in Voyager. Mm-hmm. Not sure about DS9. Well, I've always I've always loved the um, EVA sequence in Enterprise when the Romulan ship is bearing down on them. That's such a great episode. Is that the one with they're trying to defuse the mine? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, leave me out here. Leave me out here. Oh, interesting. Uh, Beverly Crusher makes a reference to horror movies. Um, it makes me wonder if they have movie nights on the D like they did on the NX-01. Exactly, exactly. There should be some Captain Proton there. Captain Proton on TNG. Coming soon to a comic shop near you. Um, yeah, I, I thought... Um, I thought it was absolutely fantastic that the writer chose to portray an autistic character in in this universe as well. I was a little disappointed, however, at the uh, kind of soap opera aspect of her subplot. You know what? I have a lot to say on that, but I'm going to save it for a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one more first reaction. It was nice to see um, a Shakespeare reference in here because that's kind of been like a Star Trek staple throughout the series. Absolutely. Keeping up that old Trek tradition. Absolutely. What reference was that, Marty? Well, it's actually one of my favorite quotes in the entire text. Um, Picard quotes, In Shakespeare's day, a king was a living extension of his land, and if you poisoned the land, presumably the king was poisoned as well. I think it quite amusing, really. Here we are in a league of mostly free worlds, a universe of progress, where we have created wonderful equality and opportunity for everyone, and yet here on our starships... We have little medieval worlds, little kings, kings who must rule wisely, lest they become tyrants. That is great. I love that. I thought that was actually one of the standout moments, too. I I went more for comedy in my favorite quotes, but I I did mark that as one of my standout moments in the book. Yeah, it was definitely one of mine as well. So with that being said, um, let's let's go into highlight the text and uh, talk about some some of the plot and writing moments. Um, how do the characters handle their situations, in your opinion? I think each character handles their situations differently. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to go through each character one by one. Please do. I'm going to start with some of the minor characters in this book. Um, Worf. He didn't get to do a whole lot in this book. Um, his actual standout moment for me is near the beginning of the book when he slips in the mud, when he's trying to jostle that door open and he just falls down in the mud. Um, That was actually my favorite Worf moment in the entire text. Aside from that, he just seems like he's written like an aggressive dog the whole book. Yeah, I I really agree with you on that. My... um... My least favorite aspects of the writing were uh, were three characters. Worf was one of them. Uh, the other two for me yeah. were, were Jordy and Riker. But uh, go ahead w- with the other characters. Well, Jordy is next, actually. So he he was just written as the guy who knew how to fix the problem. He didn't really have a lot of depth in this book. They didn't even write his love life correctly. I mean, he had a girlfriend in this book, which never ever happens to Jordy. Except for a hologram. He and yeah, she wasn't a hologram. So like I didn't understand that at all. <laughs> um but like since he did have a date, poor Jordy, he's got a date. Now he's got to ditch her to do a level one diagnostic. But we all know the truth, right? The Enterprise is his lady. It is indeed. In fact there's a wonderful moment where he's out on his spacewalk and he looks up at his nacelles and and he has this kind of moment with his engines Mm -hmm. and also a moment of fear at the same time which is kind of cool yeah you know i thought the fear was an interesting thing because one of my notes on geordie was that he seemed a lot less confident a lot less confident of himself than um than lavar ever portrayed him on screen i always looked at geordie as being so sure of his ship and so sure of everything he knows every little detail about his ship and like this time he just 
he walks out on there and it's like he doesn't even know what he's looking at. Yeah, and and I also felt like later on when they're uh, when they get back on the Enterprise when it's just the four of them helping Data, uh, I didn't like that they infused that like comedic moment with Jordy making a he was making some sort of quip to Riker, you know, in that kind of crisis when the moments are bearing down, I just would never expect Jordy to be making jokes like that. No, neither would I. Yeah, I did not like Jordy in this book at all. But moving on, Lars Fredericks, I bring him up here only because. I'm confused on his rank because in the first couple pages, he's an ensign. Then he's a lieutenant. And then the next page, he's back to being an ensign. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you noticed that. I did. Something that really stood up and really kind of took me out of it. Yeah, that was that was one of the only really glaring mistakes that I noticed in here, and it's funny too because I think in the um, in the Amazon product review for this book, somebody actually makes that reference too that it, that it was a um, a typo on the writer's part. Yeah, I think part of it too, and it's interesting because these are you know close to canon when you think about them. These came out during yeah. the era of TNG. I mean, the show was on the air when these books were coming out. They were putting these books out almost as fast as they were putting episodes out. So, I'm sure yeah. you're going to find some errors along the way. Yeah, it's a real shame that it took me out of it. But, I mean, that's that's the life of a writer, I suppose. Yeah, who do you think you would like to see uh play that role if this were uh, to have been made into an episode? Um, well, in my head I kind of envisioned him as the the lieutenant from yesterday's Enterprise that kind of woos Tasha Yar back mm. to the Enterprise C. I don't know the actor's name off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly who you're talking about. That's interesting. See, they they gave him that um, kind of Nordic portrayal. So I I, yeah. I had um, Alexander Skarsgård in my head if this had been oh, nice, made today. Nice, nice. Yeah. How how about um how about Data and Picard for you? Data and Picard were kind of they were kind of the bigger big players in this book. Data, I thought, was portrayed absolutely perfectly, mm-hmm. um, which makes sense because uh, the author has also written for the TNG series. So I could hear like every, I could hear Brent Spiner in my head as Data was speaking, pretty much. And then there's a relationship with Data and Penelope that I want to get to a little bit later, but. Um, yeah, data. Data was perfect for me. How about you? Yeah, that's. I mean, my number one note in here is that um, the data sections in this were my absolute favorite in the book because yeah, they were great. He had data. He had data's voice down perfectly. The uh, both inner and outer. The way that data kind of uh, processed uh, his surroundings. Um, you know, that's something you don't necessarily get when you're watching it. Aside from Brent Spiner's amazing performance for the entire series. Right. Uh, but but just. You read the chapters that are from Data's perspective, and you think that's exactly how I thought Data would consider things. And then Captain Picard, um, I thought he was down pretty good for the most part. There were like a few quibbles I had with the way he said certain moments, but for the most part, I think the author has got him down pat. Mm -hmm. Uh, Riding, fencing, a few other sports, those are my diversions. And of course, curling up with a good book. Alas, team sports are just not my cup of tea, said Picard. Yeah, I agree. I I looked at Picard's role in this as being very much, um, you know, that sense of duty and, uh, you know, Starfleet, you know, is right along the way. And even when even when they get to the point that they do something against their orders, you know, he kind of does it by the book. We're going to have to talk the transporter man out of it only to find that it's actually Chief (laughs) O'Brien. Right. Um, My favorite moments with Picard are his flashbacks to his time at Caltech which I have a long quote that I'm saving for later as well. Okay. His language, his tugging on his uniform, his command abilities, they were all kind of spot on for me. Um, The Enterprise and his crew are clearly the most important things to him. Um, And it was great to see him loosen up a little bit in the epilogue and have some fun um, coming in wearing a uh, fashionable beach wear. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. what do you what do you think qualifies as fashionable beachwear in the twenty fourth century? Yeah, I don't know. If you look at today's trends, he might have just been naked. He might have been. Who knows? Who knows? Well, with with those being said, uh, what do you think about Riker? Because for me, I think Riker was just a mess in this book. I I honestly didn't write much for Riker because I kind of forgot he was even in the book. Um. He said damn a lot, and he gave the command structure a little rustle, but other than that, he didn't do anything 
worth noting. Yeah, I just felt like whenever he was there, he was being so much more brash than than season five yeah. Riker. I mean, if this were if this were season one, if this were being portrayed as sometime shortly after Encounter at Farpoint, I would think maybe this is the right Riker. But he's so brash and and not thinking, and the, they talk about the way he's getting so angry. I just that did not seem like a developed. It didn't ring true to the character. There was no beard there. No, no beard at all. What did you think about about Troy? Troy, uh, I, you know, I think I think she was more or less just kind of a, a MacGuffin. She kind of advanced Penelope's plot. Um, yeah. She wasn't here nor there. She was just kind of there she to give us big, yeah. another bit of plot. She was she was like the exposition. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, there was one moment with Troy that I really disliked. She says, quote, in my experience in counseling humans utilizing my special Betazoid abilities, end quote. And I was just like, oh, no, Troy, Troy doesn't gloat like that. Mm-hmm. Troy doesn't gloat about her abilities all the time. Half the time, she's not even there when they need her abilities. So, yeah, let's not get into uh, Troy as a character on my part, because I love Marina, but I hate Troy. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. It was nice to see Chief O'Brien again. Yeah, and, and of course, to get Chief O'Brien and a Guinan moment, too. We did get a Guinan moment. Oh, Guinan. I just love that Chief O'Brien um, is on the transporter pad at the end because he drank all the other <laughs> all the other transporter operators under the table the night before, and they were hungover, so he had to take over. I thought that was a really great moment. Yeah, that was fantastic, and that was so that was so DS9 O'Brien, too, because we're in was. <laughs> 1993, you know, this is his waning days aboard the Enterprise. He's about to head over to Deep Space Nine, and I think that that was really a great O'Brien moment. I thought so as well. Final, well, not finally, but final for the main bridge crew, Beverly Crusher. What did you think about Beverly Crusher in this book? Yeah, you know, I I thought Beverly was great. She was her standard scientific self. There was one moment that I found questionable, but it also gave me a big laugh. I actually, I remember verbally laughing when I read it. It was the moment where she says, Mikhail Tilstrom is bright but annoying, just like Wesley. (laughs) I love that moment as well. That made me chuckle. I think Um, I verbally said out loud, shut up, Wesley, in that moment. It's interesting that they would write Mikael as almost a a clone of Wesley Crusher in that kind of way. But as far as Beverly Crusher is concerned, um, there were a couple moments where David is describing her, describes her as Dr. Crusher not only was a larger woman, but kept herself in good shape. And it just rubbed me the wrong way. And I don't know if that was something that's okay to say in the 90s, but like that would definitely not be okay to say today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you do. You don't call women larger. You just you just don't do it. Um, and I also felt that the author didn't describe any of the male characters in the same way as he was describing the female ones, which just you know it, it gave the whole thing a hint of sexism. Yeah, I definitely got that in there, and I thought th- there were some decidedly 1990s moments within the script. Yeah, I mean it was written in the 90s, so you you have to give it some kind of pass but if this was written if this was written now like that like we would have closed the book and taken it back by now yeah exactly exactly i also kind of felt like beverly crusher let people walk all over her in her own sick bay um she keeps telling people no but then ends up rolling over and letting them do the things anyway if he can't make a full recovery Wolf will kill himself. Not in my sick bay, he won't. I'll put him in a restraining field and post security around his door before I let him commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And even when she's over on the Starbase, too, you know, yeah. how many times in the series does a 19-year-old uh, get the better of Beverly? Not often. And how often does do you have to tell a child no and then eventually just say, all right, fine, do what you want? Yeah, yeah, With totally. Penelope. Well, Getting to Penelope, let's talk. We've talked over the main bridge crew. Let's talk about our uh, guest characters, if you will. What did you think of Penelope? Penelope, again, was another Star Trek super smart child. Um, and I'm wondering if all children are this smart in the 24th century. Uh, so far, the most realistic child I've seen presented in Star Trek has been Naomi Wildman. Yes. Uh, why do you Why do you think that children are always portrayed as like these? these genius type characters 
in Star Trek? Well, I think in some cases we might actually have gotten an answer in this book because uh, I think I think it's interesting that um, um, Mikhail is uh, portrayed as being you know substandard, so he actually gets a brain implant to increase his intelligence so that he can get himself into Stanford. And I thought that was an interesting addition um, because that would probably explain why you have this you know inordinate amount of you know super smart kids. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up, too, because he is like a substandard until he gets that implant. But why why is it necessary for him to get the implant? Why can't he just be a substandard kid? Like, I feel like, and then giving him the implant is giving him an advantage over other people. So isn't the implant kind of like cheating your way into Stanford? Isn't it cheating your way through life? Exactly. I thought that this brought up a lot of the really interesting points that the um, the augment episodes of Deep Space Nine bring up when Bashir is dealing yeah. with all those augment, you know, attempted augments. Yeah, it's definitely the same kind of thing. Um, those engram circuits. I mean, the book does mention that they're heavily regulated, but it also mentions that they're available on the black market. So literally anyone could get it and you would never know. You would never know if you're cheating your way through Stanford, cheating your way through Starfleet Academy. Like, how do they even filter those people out? Yeah, I thought I thought as I was reading that, I sat there and I thought to myself, would I actually want one of those? No way. No way would I want to have to, you know, have to alter myself to feel better, to feel, you know, equal with somebody, you know, just, just for the sake of it. And what do you think that does to Mikhail? Do you think his mother's telling him, you're not smart enough, you need this implant in your brain so that you can be smart enough to come do these things that I want you to do. Yeah, and I thought it was very interesting later on once she regains consciousness, kind of joins us as a character, that she's, you know, regretting having made that decision. I would, I mean, if I was Mikhail's mother and I did that to my child, I would absolutely regret it. I wouldn't even, like, I don't even know if I could do that to my kid. Questionable parenting. Yeah. So what did you think of uh, Dr. Tilstrom as a character? I know we only get her in the later part of the book, but I think she's still uh, still a relevant character to discuss. I think she's a wonderful, bright, happy human being. Um, I love, I love the flashbacks in Caltech with Picard when she just kind of like she's got that same kind of desire that Picard has, the desire to explore. And but she's she's smarter than Picard. Like she, if she was our captain, like she would be equal, if not better, than Picard. I believe. Yeah, yeah. You know who I um, who I kept coming back to in my head on this? I just kept thinking that this, this was interesting because this was Captain Picard's Carol Marcus. Yes, I could see that. Somebody from the past who was an intellectual equal, who he had that affair with, uh, that, that long, long ago passion, and he just consistently thinks about her. I thought that was just uh, interesting that we finally got to see a uh, Picard equivalent of, of Carol Marcus, because to this point, the only one that I can think of off the top of my head would be the, um, the uh, advocate general from Measure of a Man. Yeah, it just it's also kind of disappointing that the only way we can get emotion out of Picard is if he if he's being reunited with with someone he's had a past relationship with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in context with where this takes place in the um, in the series, of course, we're seeing a, a more um, softened Picard, if you will. This is post uh, assimilation. This is post family. But uh, it is interesting to note that this is it is it is pre this is pre, pre inner, inner light. light, correct? Yes, this is a if if you know the star date is correct, and we're looking at mid season five. This is probably a few months before the inner light. Okay, before he's had that whole life experience. Yeah, which I think you know, even though TNG wasn't serialized in the sense of how modern Trek is, I, I think we do definitely see a shift in Picard's character after the inner light. It definitely got a little serialized towards the end they didn't carry storylines over but they carried characters emotions stuff like that mm -hmm. around in the last couple seasons so that being said let's kind of talk about our main protagonist here who i think is penelope uh penelope winthrop interesting interesting star trek character why don't you uh, start it off marty yeah i i think the big thing with penelope of course is that she's autistic she is probably as far as i know 
again, this is only our second novel. As far as I know, she's the only autistic person in the 24th century. I researched autism a little bit because I, I'm not very familiar on like the specifics of it. Um, so for those who don't know, autism is defined as a mental condition present from early childhood, characterized by difficulty in communicating and forming relationships with other people, and in using language and abstract concepts. And then there's the way that Troy describes her abilities, because she is, she is partly psychic. And I thought that this was interesting as well. Um, quote, could it be possible, I wonder, if autism, at least some cases of it, might not be a child's reaction to too much stimuli because of extra talents? I speak, of course, of telepathy and empathy, abilities of the mind that Betazoids enjoy fully, of which there are only glimmerings in human history, and yet because there is no social fabric to support and nurture such talent, it would most likely be very frightening to a human child, causing it to retreat. I counseled a young Betazoid once named Tam Elburn. Tam went on to a wonderful destiny, but he had a tortured life because he was so sensitive to thoughts and emotions of others that he was unable to shut them out. Perhaps some instances of autism could have been explained this way. I sent something of psychic abilities in you, Penelope. We are going to have to explore that possibility. My question for you, Will, is what do you think about Troy's definition of autism? And how do you think it relates to autism as we know it today? Yeah, I think it's uh, I think it's interesting to look at the context of where this book came from. Nineteen ninety three, obviously, um, by that point there was a lot of study into autism, but uh, still a lot more to be learned to get to where we look at it today. I, I think it's fascinating that they actually portray it as being a uh, a curable affliction, which goes back to that nineteen ninety three right. belief that it's an affliction and not a right. um, you know a, a mental state. Well, it is it is kind of portrayed as a mental state. But, but in a very sci-fi way, mm -hmm. like it's it's portrayed as a mental state for people with psychic abilities. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and I think it's just also very great that um, I think it's great that uh, the author portrays her as a positive character rather than you know being helpless or right. in any way you know negative. She really is one of the heroes of the book because she's right. able to you know f use her abilities to help. Uh, Mikhail, who regresses into a, an almost autistic state as well. And, and and I love that they gave her like kind of normal teenager things to do, like asking a boy to the dance, learning how to dance, learning how to talk during the dance, like just kind of like stuff that honestly, I think everyday teenagers struggle with, not just people with autism. Yeah, but I, I thought I thought that Troy's definition was really interesting. And I thought that that's a concept that could only be portrayed in a sci-fi series. Mm -hmm. But then I had to ask, like, do do you think the author accurately depicted autism through Penelope? Yeah, in in all honesty, I, like you, don't know a lot about it. I have, of course, encountered people with autism in my life, but I, I don't know a lot about the intense study of it. So I can't speak from an expert position, um, I, I felt as though it was definitely a um, a dated perspective, though. You could tell that it was almost 30 years old. Yes, it, it is a very dated perspective. Um, however, given what I actually know about autism, um, which, which again, is, is not much, and comparing Penelope to, to another character that I've seen on TV with autism, um, that would be Sam from the Netflix original show Atypical, um, which, by the way, if you haven't seen it, it, it is a great show, and you should stream it immediately. I felt like the author missed missed the mark just a little bit here. Um, with with Sam, he he doesn't kind of shut down. I mean, he kind of shuts down when when situation gets stressful, but he also he's very passionate about certain things, and those passions can come on very strong to other people. And and I don't feel like they've I feel like the author made her more like a normal teenager to make her more appealing to, to readers. But I feel like he could have gone like a step further. He could have taken it to the next level and really made her like a, a standout autistic protagonist. And he just, he kind of missed it. 
Yeah, and I think I think one of the biggest problems in the in the way that her character was presented to us was that she was kind of mired in that whole soap opera subplot. Did we right. really need that security lieutenant and all the back and forth drama there? Uh, the the romantic triangle and the kind of the flirtations and it was and then they ended up just being friends in the end anyway and it was so unnecessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was so unnecessary. So I, one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, I, I've seen a lot of discussion um, in – because we are living in a, a whole new era of Trek right now in 2018. Um, there's been discussion about whether uh, Tilly from Discovery falls in the autism spectrum. Uh, how do you think that relates to, say, this character or the character from the Netflix series that you're talking about? Tilly, if she's on the spectrum, she is barely on the spectrum. You know, she's not – She's high functioning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe more of like an Asperger's kind of situation. Yeah, exactly. Um, I I thought that might have been Tilly in the beginning of the series, and now that the series has gone on, I I don't think she's on the spectrum anymore, um, because she showed a lot of like confidence and you know scientific knowledge and all that stuff. Um, I think she's just suffering from more like generalized social anxieties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are my thoughts on Tilly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that covers all of our um, our main characters for the book. Why don't we talk about our one remaining character? What did you think of the mud? Um, the mud. And I don't I mean, mean Harry. No, I think it... <laughs> Harry mud! Ah, <are> caught! <laughs> I think that it was just a... Uh, just like a lackluster kind of villain. Um, they didn't, I mean, almost for the first entire, like three quarters of the book, we didn't know what was going on with the ship. So it was kind of just one of those, I guess we'll figure it out eventually. But, um, in those little, little moments between chapters where the mud is talking, it seemed a lot more menacing than what we actually got when it, when it stood up and, and confronted data. Mm hmm. So overall, I just thought it was kind of – and then the way they solved the whole thing with the magnetic poles, and it just kind of was a little far-reaching for me. Yeah, I just kept – I kept kind of um, relating it to Arma's Skin of Evil, which I think is one of the greatest villains of, of TNG, and that kept hurting this character because it, it related at, but was so lackluster compared to such an amazing villain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because there's also no real motiva- motivation aside from a, I guess, inherent need to destroy bioorganisms. Yeah, I didn't – it just was so unrealistic. It only comes out when the poles reverse or when the poles are like wobbling around the planets. And I was – it just didn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And then, you know, I don't – it just – I mean it was what it was. So mm-hmm. it served the story. Yeah, exactly. But I think the real story here, again, was with Penelope. So I do have one more note on Penelope. Sure. That's actually really fascinating. Before we move on, she um, was paired up with Data in this in this novel because Troy felt that it would be easier to talk with someone who wasn't exactly human and who also struggled with those same kind of social anxieties and troubles that she has. And it's interesting because in doing some research for this podcast, I found an article on GeekWire written in 2013 that links back to a book written by Oliver Sacks called An Anthropologist on Mars. It was released in 1995, so two years after this book was released. And he interviews someone with autism, and they found out that often people with autism who are struggling to understand human emotion, Data was one of the few characters on TV that they could relate with because he was also trying to understand the feelings and humanity in the same way that they did. And I, I, I just blew my mind that that was already pegged. Like Data and autism were already like connected. That's amazing. I think that's really fascinating. That actually reminds me as well of a, a section in uh, William Shatner's autobiography, uh, Get a Life, where he talks about meeting somebody who had um, severe uh, emotional issues. They couldn't express emotions, and for them, they had a, a certain respect and uh, 
kindred nature with Spock. And, and that was one of the yeah. moments that touched William Shatner deeply in his life meeting Trekkies around the world. Yeah. And in the in the article on on GeekWire, Brent Spiner was talking about how he didn't really like he wasn't getting anything out of the role until he heard about these these kids that were these kids with Asperger's and autism that were really like connecting with his character. And then he 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 found that he got fulfillment out of the role through that. So I thought that was just fascinating that, that it's represented right here in Grounded. Yeah, I, I absolutely love that. I think that's fantastic. All right, so let's move into some of the writing of the book. Does the writer succeed in conveying the voices and style of the next generation and more? Will, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, for me, I think um, I think they did. I think they absolutely got the sensibilities of TNG. Again, you know, to put TNG in a wider context, of course, it was the 80s and 90s, so there's a certain uh, wholesomeness to parts of it that we don't even that we wouldn't find today. I don't think uh, I don't think we would need a chaperone to the dance on Discovery, as we saw in uh, Magic to Make the Sanest Man Go Mad. No, and that Discovery party seemed like so much fun anyway. Like I. Given any party I've seen in Star Trek, I I want to be on that Discovery party. Yes, yes. So that makes you think: Does maybe maybe the universe, uh, uh, you know, the the world of the Federation, you know, times and sensibilities change? Maybe there's a kind of a more wholesome nature going on in Enterprise D's time as opposed to Discovery's time. Maybe, yeah. Interesting. One of the things that I really uh, thought was well done in this was the fact that when they realized they were dealing with a sentient being that they actually factored the prime directive into how they handled it that they yeah. they said you know we can't just kill this right away if it's not uh, you know if it's if it's sentient and then you know they find Is that out a that a Riker suggestion I, I believe so. It's when they're talking to the admiral, who I only thing that Riker actually does in this book. Yeah, which which is funny because I think as far as Riker's concerned, he's using that as just any argument to get them to stop from blowing up the ship. But I think it's also um, it also serves to the you know the thought process of these people that they're um, you know not just willing to destroy a creature for the sake of destroying it there. And then when they find out the, you know, unabashed malevolence of this creature, then they have no choice but to pursue that. Right. And in the end scenario, they still don't even kill it. They just manage to subdue it. So it kind of goes into a stasis mode, like Khan at the end of Into Darkness or something. Yeah, it was uh, the mud creature. I can't even talk about the mud creature. I, Moving on from the mud creature. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, the most part, I thought the writing was fine. It was a little predictable, in my opinion. I kind of had the plot pinned down about halfway through the book. I knew exactly what was going to happen, how it was all going to play out. So You know something that I actually was predicting that didn't come through? I thought uh, I thought they were gearing when, uh, when they got back on the ship and um, Jordy disappears for a minute to go get his visor. I thought that they were actually going to have uh, the mud creature, sorry to keep bringing it back to him, uh, the mud creature was going to possess Jordy in the same way that he does Mikhail Tilstrom. So uh, I, when Jordy came back, I fully expected him to be like acting a little weird, and then suddenly he tried to sabotage them. Unfortunately, the mud creature was not that smart. <laughs> but but they but they even established early on that Jordy's visor was made by the same company that it, that makes the brain implants. Well, then that was a missed opportunity, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of a ray at the end of Ghostbusters yeah. 2 moment. Oh, God. Um, yeah, the big reveal just wasn't as fun because I had already guessed it and I was following the trail of breadcrumbs that was laid out for us. Mm -hmm. um, although the breadcrumb trail was fun, I, I already knew the destination. I had a couple of roll-my-eye moments, uh, one in particular that I that I actually highlighted here. Um, when Jordy says, we all have phasers and we know how to use them, and I believe we all know the way to engineering. <laughs> it was just kind of like, oh, brother. Computer and program. Computer and program. Computer! Close the book. But other than that, I thought that the Arthur absolutely portrayed the voice of the series, Next Generation. Um, lots of talking, lots of exposition, a little bit of action at the end. It was kind of how TNG goes for the most part. Characters were pretty true, with the exception of, like, Riker and Jordy and Worf. How about you? What did you think? 
Yeah, I mean, I I agree on all that. The like I said earlier, the creature reminded me of Armus, uh, reminded me of the Borg, the you know un unwilling need to um, expand and just take over everything and kill anything in its way. So I think you had a lot of classic Trek tropes in here. You can see that this was a rejected episode premise. Yeah, I think it would have been a decent season two episode and a really bad season five episode. Good call there. I like that. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about a few canon connections in the writing here. You think it's all connected somehow? What connections to known episodes or films did you find in the text? Okay, so in my notes, um, there's some tangential references to the best of both worlds with battling the Borg, and um, uh, Riker has a whole section where he's talking about growing up on Alaska with his father, so there's some references to the Icarus factor. Uh, but the book, really closely relates to uh, the two-episode story arc of Data Lore and Silicon Avatar, uh, which, uh, you know, if, if the star date on this is accurate, then this is set shortly after uh, Silicon Avatar and the destruction of the Crystalline Entity. Uh, and then there's the also... The Crystalline Entity is actually mentioned a few times in the sev story. Several times several in there, times, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there are a lot of references to uh, Tin Man, which, as we previously stated, the author of this novel wrote the teleplay for, so so he, yeah. uh, he was getting a lot of references to his big Trek moment into uh, his book as well. Yeah, I have a couple of those Tin Man moments written down. Specifically, quote, we have encountered Silicon Life before. Have we? Tin Man, for one, said Troy. And immediately following that, Beverly Crusher noted, quote, lots of others not so obvious. Silicon-based life might not be oxygen breathers, but they can still consist of stuff analogous to flesh and blood. And that's then there's the extreme. She took a breath. The crystalline entity, which was very dramatic. She took a breath. <laughs> dramatic. I wrote in my notes here. Ooh, double callback. You can get the uh, music swelling at that moment when she says it. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, relating to Tin Man as well, uh, you have not only that reference, but early on when she's talking about Penelope, she's talking about Tam Elbrun, who, of course, ends up uh, boarding the Tin Man in the episode. Yeah, she does. They do. They did reference that. Yeah. I mentioned that earlier, I think. Yeah, you, you did that exact quote. So I thought that was interesting that the writer managed to get so many, you know, out of a series, we were season five, we were 130 episodes into TNG. There is a lot of direct relating to the one previous episode that the author had written yeah, at this point. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was basically like he's writing himself a sequel. Exactly. Um, I also noticed a moment where Captain Picard says, the days of foolhardy risk to the commanding officer are over, which was... I think a callback to Captain Kirk in his days of commanding the Enterprise, where he would just he would join the landing parties and do all sorts of crazy stuff. I love that you mentioned that because I have that exact same thing on here. It's on page twenty two. Yeah. And I thought it was a great line because then later in the book, Captain Picard takes a foolhardy risk to save the Enterprise. Yes, absolutely. So I was like, Oh, they brought it back. And I think it's interesting, too, because um, you see kind of this ebb and flow in the series because it really depends on the um, the character of the captain. You know, TOS, you had Kirk going out on so many of the missions. TNG, Picard, is is very reserved in, in terms of away missions. And then, of course, Deep Space Nine, Cisco's out there all the time. And then Voyager, yeah. Jan Janeway's kind of back on the ship, not going out as much. Well, have you heard that documentary, I believe, where it's discussed that TOS Kirk was Gene Roddenberry in his younger days. Like, that's the man he wanted to be when he was younger. And then when he got older and made TNG, he kind of reflected himself as this older, more reserved, kind of gentlemanly character um, in Captain Picard. And he made Riker the kind of younger, more brash, more risk-taking character, which I've always thought is fascinating, that it's like, the two halves of Gene Roddenberry's life are Kirk and Picard. That is a great point, Marty. Just really, absolutely great insight. Thank you, thank you. I think one of my favorite moments, now that we're moving out of that, 
I loved the logs, the personal logs that everyone gives in Chapter 17. Each one of our main bridge characters gives a personal log. I'm curious if you had a favorite one. I didn't have a favorite single one. My favorite moment, of course, in that whole chapter was when Worf just threw his recorder against the wall and crushed it. <laughs> Again, he's just like an angry dog. I yeah, didn't exactly. understand Worf at all. Exactly. And my thought, on, my note here specifically on that whole chapter is that, um, you know, I, I'm so glad that that wasn't part of an episode because that would be just a really boring segment to go from person to person. It's like, uh, welcome to this new series, Star Trek Rashomon. <laughs> It was nice to see a callback to Alexander, though. Yes. Good to know he's still doing well, even though Worf is like the worst father in the Federation, <laughs> some might argue. Yeah, it just that, that whole chapter just it, it stood out to me as being an odd place to, ha- to just suddenly like stop and we have these random interviews, you know, self-imposed interviews with each of the people. I, I kind of liked it, actually, because it was it was like a moment where the ship's about to be towed out for destruction and you're kind of giving everyone's point of view on like how they're feeling about it and where they're going to go after it. Mm -hmm. I thought, I thought it was really nice. Actually. I like that. It was one of my favorite moments in the book. Interesting. Interesting. And then there's a moment in captain Picard's log. If you don't mind, please. Um, should the enterprise be destroyed, we shall all have to endure a period of grief and recovery, a process that will not be negated by the presence of the people we have grown to love our family. We shall survive. We shall endure. This is our nature. I hope it does not mean the end of our work together. But if it does, the universe will still have been better place for having had the Enterprise and its crew in it. And I thought that was a wonderful Picard speech. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think Picard is a, a very interesting, humble character because he says, you know, in one of the points, he says a line where uh, he'll be relegated to a couple of sentences in history. No, Jean-Luc, you're going to be an entire book. Yeah, and and he is. Yes, the autobiography of Jean-Luc Picard coming soon to this podcast. Coming soon. All right. I have written in my notes, what did you think about the clay as a foil? But I think I think we've covered that enough. Yeah, I think I think it was interesting for me um, because I didn't know I didn't know this puts a context to it right now to to this podcast and makes it a little timely. But uh, it's very interesting that this was the uh, plot of the book too. When going into it, I had no awareness that it was a clay and a mud that was the villain. I actually live uh, in Santa Barbara County, and for those of you who know world events, we actually just experienced a massive mudslide here, and uh, it's it's intriguing that this was the plot that we chose for for this episode because I am literally surrounded by mud right now. Yes, yeah, so I just it's interesting the the. the the choice of the mud being the villain. I, I don't think I would have gone there, but uh, yeah, it worked, I guess, as a plot device. Yeah, it worked. I think it works for the novels better than it works for TV. So you can get away with a lot more in the novels. And you know, something else that I think also works really well in the novels is the holodeck, because um, obviously the holodeck is one of the great, great tropes of, of TNG and beyond. You know, its invention, I think, was a was a changing point for Star Trek because it allowed, you know, this space-bound galaxy to to get to like the Old West or get to Shakespeare, ancient times, any different aspect that they wanted to do. Um, I think the novels take an even greater advantage of holodecks because they can put you into things that the shows didn't have budgets for. Uh, I don't remember which book it was, but I know one of the TNG novels, we may cover it at some point, has a sequence where Riker is actually piloting a uh, U.S. Air Force fighter jet on the holodeck. So That's it, pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, it gives you all sorts of options that you you couldn't even do on television at the time because they you know they had great budget for TNG but it wasn't you know like Game of Thrones is today. Yeah, yeah. I I'm excited to dive more into those kind of holodecky novels to see what we can pull out of those. Yeah, absolutely. It was nice that they used the holodeck in this book as as the recreation mm-hmm. and not as the plot device. Yeah, I thought I thought it was interesting the idea of them all playing volleyball, and I'm not gonna I'm gonna say too much because our uh, our next sequence is favorite quotes, and one of my favorite quotes relates to the holodeck. All right, well let's move right into favorite quotes then. All right, I guess I will go right into it then. Uh, my number one favorite, and I went for purely comedic ones. I I thought about that one that you talked about the Shakespearean reference to kings, but you know that it was such a long one. I went for just single one-liners as my two favorite quotes. My first one is I will paint the picture for you. Worf in a bathing suit playing volleyball. Got it. Serve again and prepare for defeat. 
<laughs> yes, that was classic Worf moment. And what was your number one uh, favorite quote, Marty? I have two. One of them is rather long. One of them is from the flashback with Dr. Tilstrom. And then I have another one that's a little bit shorter. Um, I'll read the long one first. Quotes, once when I was a little girl, my father brought me back a sea creature from Storm Gen 10. It was like a living rainbow one moment. And then after it fed, it would change into an entirely different creature. It had the oddest eyes, and it responded to you when you looked at it with odd signaling motions and ripplings of its dorsal antennae and facial muscles that made it look like a creature from a cartoon. It was very funny and very beautiful and amused me greatly. The next time my father came home, he asked me if I had learned anything from the monkfish. That's what I called it. Well, I learned responsibility. I tended it well. And I learned a great deal about animal behavior because it had interested me enough to read about it in books and to read other books on animals. But what pleased my father the most was when I said, finally, I had learned that the universe must be a fascinating and mysterious and wonderful place to have such a strange creature in it. He smiled and said, good. That's what I had hoped it would do. Because that had started us talking about all the things he'd done and what he'd learned. But you know what else he said? He said, you know, the monkfish probably finds you as strange as you find it. That made me laugh. It delighted me more than I can tell you. To be as strange and unique as the monkfish. To be me and shine so full of colors and the exotic breath of alien worlds. And I love that quote just for for the purposes of of learning just to be yourself. Like to just shine your brightest self, even if it's a little strange. Like someone's going to find you beautiful in the universe. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. I thought that was really great. My uh, my next one, again, just a one-liner. You're going very philosophical, and I love that. I'm, but I apologize for my long quotes. Don't, don't. I love, a, I love a good, like, emotional tug, so. Well, that's great. There's going to be a counterbalance then. You go for the emotions, I'll go for the comedy, because my, my second favorite quote is uh, Guinan in 10 Forward discussing how to dance, and I won't even try to do a Whoopi Goldberg impression because she is exactly just the best. I know line you're going to say, and I love it. Just move your butt a little. That's all it takes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, Guinan. You can picture Whoopi saying that, too. Yes. Yes. I love her so much. She was at uh, STLV uh, the year before last, and she was just absolutely the highlight of the convention. Oh, man. I'm sad I missed that one. So what was your, uh, what was your last quote? My next quote is, I believe it is a data quote. Quote, emotions enrich what we are, after all comparatively short biological lives emotions give depth and variety to experience they create bonds with energies other than purely the physical and bonds that i believe may affect in some way the spiritual levels if such exist in the universe that's great another great quote from from data a great data moment that whole scene was a great data moment yeah this book i mean data owns this book i think data shines data shines in this book Data shines in everything he does. Yes, truly, truly. One other thing that I actually wanted to mention, I have it in my notes under the quotes. I didn't pull the exact quote, but um, I had it as a note, and I wanted to hit it when we were talking about Penelope earlier. I thought it was fascinating uh, early on in one of the early holodeck sequences when um, Penelope says something along the lines of, um, everyone on the Enterprise is perfect, and I'm not. I thought that was well, that yeah. was just a really interesting moment because – that's kind of what, you know, Star Trek, you know, is that utopian future where everybody is the absolute best that they can be. And I think that's interesting to have, you know, somebody who feels like they aren't their absolute best in, in that mix. Yeah. It's really terrible feeling to have too. I've had that feeling many times throughout my life and it's it's just the worst. Yeah. Oh, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, Penelope, speaking of, I, I, I really related to her towards the end of the novel. Um, at first, I kind of felt her kind of trying and annoying. But then as the novel went on, like, I kind of connected to Penelope just because of those those kind of social struggles she deals with. Mm-hmm. Well, why don't we move on to our next uh, segment here? Yeah, let's move into our next segment, Shelve It, where we're going to wrap up the novel and give our final thoughts. We'll... What has the theme or message of this novel been, in your opinion? Uh, well, I think for for me, um, 
one of the strongest themes that I found in there was uh, Picard's balance of personal feelings and duty. I thought it was very subtle, but um, the writer really managed to reflect the way Picard can keep that exterior as is, even while he's dealing with something deeply personal. Uh, I think another important theme is, um, you know, embracing diversity, the diversity that, um, that, that is found in data and in Penelope. And uh, I just, mm-hmm. I, I think those were really the standouts. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, what I pulled from it was a theme of being yourself. I'm just not, not worrying about what other people think of you with the Penelope character and the Mikkel character. Yeah. Uh, Mikkel, Mikkel to me was Mikkel, not so much, but, yeah. but definitely Penelope, even Picard just kind of like coming out of a shell and just being like, who he wants to be yeah i thought it was interesting to have them end with um picard coming to the volleyball game because that really reminded me a lot of the final scene in all good things the series finale with him finally joining them for poker yeah that's that's what i got out of that too that scene in the epilogue so marty what are your final thoughts on grounded overall i thought it was a solid solid tng story um there were you know we talked about the few kind of minor issues we had with them but overall it was it was an interesting story i think i'd give this one um three out of five delta shields mostly for the attention to the characters alone because i thought the plot was a little weak yeah i agree it's a fun single episode story this would not have been a two-parter in tng time uh it just it's a good little read and uh if you find a copy of it in your used bookstore or you want to pick it up on your kindle it's definitely worth going through and and again it's you know it's all about data in this one if you like data if you are a data person then i would definitely recommend it to you yeah i gave this one a warp six out of warp 9.8 you're still over the warp speed limits, but we'll allow it. Starfleet Starfleet Command approves. <laughs> All right, so let's move into some of our fan feedback this week. Um, this week we asked you what some of your favorite Trek novels were, and boy, did you deliver. Yeah, that's right, Marty. So we have gotten over 45 different novel recommendations, uh, including uh, DS9's A Stitch in Time, TNG's Imzadi, the Destiny Trilogy, and so much more. Uh, Several of you have also suggested the autobiographies of Captain James T. Kirk and Captain Jean-Luc Picard, and as I intimated earlier, we are excited to announce that both of these will be featured in upcoming shows. We want to thank you for being so supportive of us as we get this show up and running, and we hope to deliver nothing but quality content to you now and in the future. Next time on Reading Trek, we will begin our first two-part episode discussing the first half of the new Star Trek Discovery novel, Drastic Measures, by Dayton Ward. Wow, is that a book? It is 2246, ten years prior to the Battle at the Binary Stars, and an aggressive contagion is ravaging the food supplies of the remote Federation colony Tarsus IV and the 8,000 people who call it home. Distress signals have been sent, but any meaningful assistance is weeks away. Lieutenant Commander Gabriel Lorca and a small team assigned to a Starfleet monitoring outpost are caught up in the escalating crisis and bear witness as the colony's governor, Adrian Kodos, implies an unimaginable solution in order to prevent mass starvation. While awaiting transfer to her next assignment, Commander Philippa Georgiou is tasked with leading to Tarsus IV, a small, hastily assembled group of first responders. It's hoped this advance party can help stabilize the situation until more aid arrives. But Georgiou and her team discover that they're too late. Governor Kodos has already implemented his heinous strategy for extending the colony's besieged food stores and safeguarding the community's long-term survivals. In the midst of their rescue mission, Georgiou and Lorca must now hunt for the architect of this horrific tragedy and the man whom history will one day brand Kodos the Executioner. I am so excited for this. And for those of you who uh, may not be TOS-oriented, if you're planning on reading this book, Definitely go on Netflix or CBS All Access and check out the classic TOS episode, The Conscious of Kings. I will definitely do that before I read this book because I am a little 
unfamiliar with TOS for the most part. I've only watched that series once, so I'm due for a rewatch. If you'd like to follow along with us, we'll be breaking this book up into two parts, like a traditional book club. It's the first time we're doing this. Um, we don't have the book in our hands yet, so we don't know where the break is going to be, but we will definitely let you know what chapters we'll be covering via social media. And as always, links to the upcoming selections can be found in the show notes on our Facebook page and on our Twitter at Reading Trek. Before we finish today's podcast, let's let everyone know how they can get a hold of us to continue the conversation. You can find me on Twitter at William G. Conlin and on Facebook in the unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas convention group. Marty, where can people find you? You can also find me in the unofficial Star Trek Las Vegas convention group and on Twitter at Time Travel Marty. You can find the show on Twitter at Reading Trek, or you can visit us online at readingtrek.thetricordertransmissions.com. If you want to leave us a voicemail with your thoughts on our next show, please call 609-512-5527. That's 609-512-LLAP. Please keep your message to two minutes or less, but we really want to know what you have to say. You can also send us an email at readingtrekpodcast at gmail.com. Absolutely. We really want to hear your feedback, people. If you like this show, please check out the other shows available from the Tricorder Transmissions Network, such as Drawing Trek, Shore Leave, Disco Trek, Trek Ranks, and Politrex. Please support this vibrant, fan-based podcast network by visiting patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions for subscriber perks and exclusive access. And with that, Captain Picard wants us to let him read in peace. I will leave you now to your book. That is all I ask.